Welcome in to the PFF Podcast. Steve Palazzolo back here with Sam Monson. We're going to be reviewing all things week four. Uh, a little scriptless here this week, Sam. I, I like to be prepared, and you just said, let's just talk about the craziness of week four. I feel like that's how we started last week, too. We've had more than enough of you being prepared this morning already. I think we need to, we need to go off the script. We need to go completely ad-lib AWOL and just run with it because Sam, the last time you had a script, it, it took us all morning. Sam, the people don't know that I screwed up one line 12 straight times well, for this week's Well Actually segment. They don't need to know that. They do know that. Well, now they do. They do. The cat is out of the bag. Sometimes the mind's just a little fried from staying up all night watching football. Yes. So I struggled. Hey, it was a fun week four. We're going to dive into it. So... What do you think, Sam? What what was the the crazy of the crazy for you this week that you want to dive into to start? Again, this oh, every week with the NFL this season has been what is going on, and this week, like ever, the Houston Texans scored fifty seven points on offense, or fifty seven no, points. Okay, not all, all right, all right. All right. It's not they all put up fifty seven points against the Tennessee Titans. Accurate. A couple of weeks ago, it didn't look like this team could score at all. I mean, we were saying they were going to win this. If anyone was going to win between Houston and the Cincinnati Bengals, it was whoever would score a touchdown. And that's basically how it worked out. Deshaun uh, Watson rattled off this great run from the pocket, scored a touchdown. That was all she wrote. Um, For the first two weeks of the season, this team didn't look like it could put up points at all. Then suddenly they catch life against the New England Patriots. We put that down to the Patriots' defense being pretty terrible. Uh, Then they rack up 57 against the Titans. This team has gone seven points. 13 points, 33 points, 57 points. At this rate, by like week eight, they'll be scoring 100 in the first quarter. I think it's more than that even. You think? It's probably more than that. I, I'm going to rely. I'm not, I'm, so I didn't do the math. We, we kind of laughed at the Deshaun Watson MVP hype. Are we still laughing? Well, it was farcical. I mean, it was ridiculous when people started claiming it. Uh, right now, I mean, that was the best game of his career by a distance this week against Tennessee. But... I mean, I don't want to say it was the only good game of his career, but it was by far the best game of force of the four games that he's played so far. Um, week one, he was terrible, awful. In relief, now, since he's been yes, a starter. And that's fine. Week two, he wasn't good, but he rattled off that one game yeah, the one big run. run. Yeah, as a passer, he was very inconsistent. So if you take out the one run where he somehow avoided the entire Cincinnati defense, which admittedly is a significant play to be taking out and did win them the game. But if you put that to one side and look at everything else he did in that game, he wasn't good. Um, and then looked reasonable against New England. But the again, top, the top end plays yeah. were what stood out. The top end plays were really special against New England. But again, we all put that down in part to this New England defense looking anything like itself. Right. Um, and then this week, we actually saw good Deshaun Watson. We He's saw fantastic. We saw the ceiling. We saw the player that he could be. Um, but I mean, I don't. This, the MVP thing is still ridiculous to me because yeah, he hasn't been that guy for four weeks. He's been. This guy, this week. Yeah, so the MVP thing, absolutely ridiculous. Agree with you there. But uh, coming into the season, uh, every time we talked about the rookie quarterbacks, I brought up two guys, Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes, as this season key players. Now, Patrick Mahomes, the way Alex Smith is playing, probably not going to see the field. Watson, though, thinking this guy's going to be at the helm of a team that has a playoff caliber defense. He is one of the biggest wild cards in the entire NFL. And if he keeps playing like that, I'm not talking MVP. I'm just saying now, a week a week after it looked like Tennessee was ready to establish themselves as the AFC South favorites, it, it completely flips the script in that entire division. Well, they're already back joint top of the division, having been having looked like one of the worst teams in the uh, in the NFL through two weeks. They're suddenly tied with the Jacksonville Jaguars and the Tennessee Titans for the best team in the AFC South, which is the most confusing and ridiculous looking division I can think of. I, I don't know what any of those teams are, except that I'm pretty certain that the Colts suck. The one thing that seems to be consistent in the NFL is the inconsistency of some of these teams. So the Tennessee Titans lose to Oakland in week one. Not too bad because we think Oakland's one of the best teams in the AFC. Though Turns maybe, out that's not true. Turns either. out that might not be true. Then they destroy the Jacksonville Jaguars. They beat the Seattle Seahawks at home and get absolutely wrecked by the Houston Texans. So chalk the Tennessee Titans up as inconsistent, much like many other teams. Yeah, and there's a bunch of teams for whom that's true so far in the season. Jacksonville is another good example. The whole AFC South. (laughs) Yeah, but you can go beyond them as well. 
But Jacksonville, we thought, was just a case of they would beat up a bad team and lose to a good team. Right. Know, the way that defense was shut down um, and the way they they took advantage of some bad teams. Then they go and face the Jets and allow like a million rushing yards on the ground and lose to the New York Jets, who we were predicting, certainly Mike was predicting to go 0-16 this year. You know, they, they're, they're not a good team, and they beat the Jacksonville Jaguars. The Baltimore Ravens have been up and down. They're now 2-2, two and two, having suffered shellackings at the hand of the Jacksonville Jaguars and won games themselves. The Jets are, have the same record through four weeks as the New England Patriots. Everyone expected that. Exactly. The Buffalo Bills head the AFC East with 3-1. and one. It looks like it was just a year too soon with my Super Bowl bandwagon there. Um, I, this, the league is chaos. I love it. It's a great season because not everything always goes according to the script. Let's discuss the Buffalo Bills because, you know, we always talk about home road and, you know, it is a big factor. They go into Atlanta to beat them. The Buffalo Bills have not given up more than 17 points in a game, and they gave up 17 yesterday to the Falcons. So I haven't fact-checked this, but I'm going to drop name drop our, uh, our office buddy, Austin Gale, who said that that was Tyrod Taylor's first game in a dome. Really? First time he's played in a dome. And is, I think he was saying... Certainly NFL career. I think he was talking about college as well. But probably played Syracuse at some point. Whatever. In the Carrier Dome. At I least think. in the NFL. That apparently was the first time that guy's played in a dome. When you can see, when we talk about, you know, road, home road splits, indoors, outdoors, I mean that's a thing. Like Tyrod Tyrod has been, you know, awesome, as I've been saying for a while, despite playing outdoors the whole time. Nobody's ever put the man in a building in a dome where he can truly unleash his potential and show everyone how awesome he is. So first off, you're making the case for Tom Brady being better than Peyton Manning because P- Peyton certainly inflated his numbers in domes for years. Whatever. That's it. But Tyrod now, on pace, if he was to play in a dome for the rest of his career, 106.7 passer rating. Tyrod's basically Hall a Hall of Famer. Famer. Yeah, that, I mean, we're That's on the I'm same saying. page here. We are on the same page. His uh, red zone touchdown was a beauty. He had a lot of time in the pocket, but... Uh, tight window throws, really important in the NFL. That was a tight window throw, put it right where it needed to be. Uh, yes, you love Tyrod Taylor. A little bit. Um, so we, we exaggerate just a little bit. But let's, let's discuss this Buffalo Bills defense. Uh, Sean McDermott comes in. He's the head coach. He's, he comes from the Carolina Panthers. And schematically what the Panthers do, uh, and now what the Bills do, it's witchcraft, uh, a lot of cover f- two, four, and six. So that's a lot of zone coverage. If anybody watched the New England Carolina game yesterday, you saw that just, and they mentioned it on the broadcast, just a ton of zone coverage. Buffalo's doing something similar. Uh, I think it's a great way to play defense. It, I think it helps protect some of your guys in the secondary, puts them in a good place to succeed. But if you look at just the, at Buffalo's grades, and this is consistent with what's happened in Carolina. Carolina through the years would take you know, rogue safeties, anybody, just guys that were average safeties and they'd start grading well and they put them in good positions. They made Roman Harper success. look good. Yes, which was very difficult to do. Very difficult to do. At, at, that, at his point in his career, he was a useful player once for the Saints against the run in certain places. Way back when. Way back when. And they made him into a pretty good player as a guy that could play deep a little bit and do some different things. So they're doing the same thing now with Jordan Poyer, with Micah Hyde. They've got the best rookie corner in the NFL right now, and Tredavious White, one of the best corners in all of the NFL. So, and maybe maybe Marshawn Lattimore is up there with him too. But regardless, scheme wise, they're getting the most out of what looked like a defense that did not have much talent. The whole roster looked like it was getting blown up to start again in 2018, and it's it's one of the surprises of the season. That defense has completely transformed itself without adding a huge amount of talent to it. Um, and the offense has been hasn't suffered much of a drop off despite shipping out their entire receiving core. A guy like Zay Jones, who was supposed to be a big impact player for this offense um, as a rookie, has one of the worst drop rates in the NFL. What did I say? It was forty eight percent or something Way insane high, like yeah. that. Um, and really, it's been Tyrod, the running game, and the defense, which is fine, but that shouldn't be leading the AFC East and sitting there with the Patriots at two and two. It's just, it's bizarre. So ultimately we're still four weeks into the season. We're still working on small sample sizes and we don't want to jump to conclusions on these things. There still is that element of what you thought in the preseason holds a little bit of weight. Yeah. Uh, So 
I don't think anybody's truly going to expect Buffalo to win 12 games. No, but the last two weeks, I think, are big for them in terms of who they beat. Now, they beat the Denver Broncos and then traveled to Atlanta to beat what should be the best team in the in the NFC. That's the one. Okay, they were without Julio Jones and Mohamed Sanu for much of that game injured, but still, those are two significant victories. Can we discuss Matt Ryan for a quick second? Sure. He has been, and just looking at his game grades, consistently middle of the path, consistently average from a game grade standpoint. Yeah, I watched it. I don't put too much traction on the preseason, but he had he just looked bad at times during the preseason. I had been predicting statistical decline for him, but not necessarily playing uh, decline, not like PFF grade decline, because he's always been a pretty good quarterback. Yeah, uh, He's only completed three passes beyond 20 yards. He was one of the best deep ball throwers last year. Every time somebody asked me, are the Falcons the best team hands down in the NFC, I'd say no, because I just don't trust this pass game like I did a year ago. So I expected some regression, but I wasn't expecting Matt Ryan to look as average as he has so far. Interesting quirk of the PFF grading. Every, last year, Matt Ryan's career year looked amazing, put up some mind-blowing numbers. Not actually his highest graded PFF season. As far as uh, overall, overall PFF grade. grade. Yeah. I think there was one, whatever his good year is, 2012, 2012 was like yeah. 0. 0.1 higher. So, I mean, it was, was a career year and obviously how far they went and all that kind of stuff. But he has been pretty much as good as that before. Um, yeah, I told, so two years ago, we were trying to. His stats were bad in 2015, and we were trying to say, "No, no, no! Matt Ryan is way better than these stats have shown." And then last year, I kept saying, "No, no, no! Matt Ryan is not as good as yeah. these stats are showing." And again, I think that's where the PFF grade helps us kind of sort out throw for throw the difference between getting help from playmakers, getting interception luck, and all these different things that roll into stats when the PFF grade can really isolate the throw for a quarterback. I think I expected both in terms of both a statistical decline and a grading decline the purely because have gone down a little bit yeah purely right. because i didn't just didn't expect him to hit that high again i mean right. he's done it twice in his career his baseline is still really good but you know five points lower than that so i was kind of expecting somewhere like that you know he's a grade to come down from 92.6 last year to like 87 80 you know something like that which would have been he's hit an 87.5 in 2015 he's hit an 89.3 in 2011 and 87.1 in 2010 that's kind of more of his baseline so that's where i expected him to be but yeah he has so i mean he's 77.6 right now he is significantly below that both in terms of well in, in every in all terms might have to talk to zach about breaking him down this week on the qb pod keep an eye out for that all right next big surprise there was a bunch of them but panthers go into new england and maybe these aren't becoming surprises because new england's defense statistically historically bad through four games and the Panthers you know the Panthers offense was like the remedy for the New, the New Orleans Saints defense a week ago should have been the remedy for the Patriots defense but that wasn't the case Cam Newton best game of the season and the Panthers pretty much did what they wanted to do on offense yeah I mean we said that going into that New Orleans game that New Orleans Saints defense was playing badly enough that it would make the Panthers' offense look good. But actually, it was the other way around. The, the Panthers' offense was so bad, it made the Saints' defense look good. That's what it was. And somehow, this, the New England defense is actually bad enough that the Panthers' offense looks good. Um, having said that, we had this big, long um, conversation about the Carolina Panthers last week and all the ways they were screwing up using their star quarterback cam newton don't laugh at us taylor it was 20 minutes of great carolina panthers discussion that it, all of our listeners loved it was podcast magic is what it was i think it was go back and listen if you haven't heard it yeah we're not going to do it again right now i we're promise not. thank you um but they started to use him more the way that they used him before and they the way they did. did they haven't been so far this season so we got to see some more of that legitimate cam newton you know the running between the tackles so the stuff that he needs to be doing to be the cam newton of old um and but some of the the regular numbers are insane as well. Um, his when he wasn't pressured this week, he had a pass rating of 136.4. Completed 15 of 19 passes, which is 78.9 percent, for an average of 13.7 yards, um, three touchdowns. So I mean, we saw Cam Newton be an effective passer. Coincidentally, the same week that they start using him the way they used him before. And on the other side, New England's defense. Uh, unbelievable coverage busts so yes, they had again uh everybody's talking about how are they using christian mccaffrey well they faked a bubble screen to christian mccaffrey 
and eight out of 11 defenders on New England ran after McCaffrey, leaving uh, Fozzie Whit- Whitaker wide open for a walk-in screen pass. Another reason why, look, Cam played really well. <laughs> the stats were inflated a little bit. We had a coverage bust there. Another one of his touchdowns, uh, New England could not figure out how to cover a bunch set. And this was what used to make New England's defense special, was just not giving up big plays, just not having coverage busts. They weren't spectacular. They just had guys that could communicate. It feels like the opposite this year. Stephon Gilmore looks pretty bad out there. And, you know, everybody talked about that as this questionable signing. And it's a game like that. Just did not look like he's fitting in over there so far. There's a bunch of offenses so far this year that have be, been using this double slant combination from stack, some from stacked receivers and from bunch sets as if it's like new and they've just invented this as this uncoverable route combination. And for some reason, the defenses are reacting to it as if it's new and has never existed before and is complete and total uncoverable witchcraft because you know the guy pressing whoever is at the top of the stack or the, the, the bunch formation, he's okay covering his slant, but the guy behind him can't get to the second slant and just gets essentially screened out of the play. But, I mean, there are guys inside of that. All you need is a linebacker paying attention for the second slant coming towards him, and you can cut that out. I don't understand why this is proving so tricky for defenses to deal with. Such is the cat and mouse game in the NFL. So for Carolina, a team that uh, overall has had a solid defense. You take away... Now, look, they did give up 30 to New England yesterday. They gave up 34 to New Orleans two weeks ago. But overall, I think that's a defense uh, that's still closer to the top end of the league. And New England, their offense still looks fine now. Uh, Brady's playing well. Pass game's pretty good. But they have not had a defense this bad. Now they're looking like a team that used to just roll through the AFC. And even if they do that again, even if they settle down and do that, Usually this stuff comes back to bite you. So they they need to make not just slight improvements on defense. They need to make massive improvements on defense because uh, Brady did was used doing his usual fourth quarter magic, and they were about to stop Carolina. Stephon Gilmore picks up the illegal hands to the face penalty that prolongs the drive and leads to the game winning field goal for the Carolina Panthers. So the Patriots defense certainly in trouble. We'll see them Thursday night against the Tampa Bay Bucks and see how they can turn things around what else do you have for surprises or bigger storylines before we get into the monday confessional this was your idea you just wanted to confess to everybody how much you sucked in the preseason well not just me all of us oh, oh we're we, all we'll yeah, all do it i think we all blew this any other so far any other big so i mean the rams the rams at dallas yeah i wasn't expecting that i kept waiting for the rams to just kind of come back down to earth but he dropped they just dropped 35 again no big deal That was the big part of that, the surprise, how much production they managed to have. I wasn't surprised that it was a close game and that they, even that they nicked it. I thought Dallas would win, but when we previewed that, I thought, I think we all thought it would be a pretty close game. I I guess, yeah, the the production, the volume, the output of that Rams offense was the surprise there, but not necessarily they were competitive and good enough to to take the game. So that Rams offense, uh, check out this week, Sam and I are weekly hashtag well actually with sports illustrated we're going to break down jared goff and his improvement here in year two and what has gone into that but it's uh certainly one of the stories of the nfl the suddenly high-powered rams offense it's like the what what did uh the boss call it the greatest show on surf a couple weeks ago did you hear that no thursday night football against you don't like that no that's terrible you should never use that again I will tell Chris you do when that. he's in here that you might you might get fired. I don't think that's going to happen. He called it the greatest show on surf. I don't know if it'll stick, but they're scoring a lot of points. All right. Did you have anything else you wanted to touch on before we confess? No, I think that's good for this week. Now we're going to go into what we blew <laughs> heading into the season, where we screwed up. All right. So we're calling this Monday confessional. We're a month into the season. And it's, you know, it's just a quarter of the way through. <laughs> but I think there's certainly some stuff where we, where we thought one thing and uh, the results have not been the same. I, I'm, I would implore you to maybe stick to your guns because it's so early. But if you want to completely confess that you screwed up, that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll confess some stuff as well. So what did you, what were you wrong about coming into the season, Sam? I don't think that the Oakland Raiders are as good as I thought they would be. You had them in the you had them as yeah. your non Patriots AFC pick. Exactly, they were my 
pick for the Super Bowl, my dark horse pick for the Super Bowl on the basis that the Patriots were everybody's pick for the Super Bowl, which, by the way, it looks like we also screwed up. Um, With that defense, it'll be difficult, yes. Yes. And the Raiders just don't look as good as they should be. And it's difficult to actually pin that down to a conclusive reason. I mean, the weapons are still there, although Amari Cooper can't catch a football at the moment. Um, the offensive line is still good. It's not maybe as dominant as it was a year ago, but it's fine. I mean, they were able to all but eliminate Von Miller yesterday by having Marshall Newhouse helped out with chip blocks. I mean, once you can take away the worst single link on your offensive line when he's going up against Von Miller, you're in pretty good shape. They allowed four total pressures as a unit going up against the Denver Broncos who have one of the league's best pass rush. So the offensive line is still there. Derek Carr, for some reason, has stopped playing like the Derek Carr we knew, has gone into a shell, all kinds of check downs, very little in terms of aggressive down the field stuff, albeit there was a deep bomb that they scored uh, against that was the their only yesterday. Yeah, but play, it was right? the only one. Um, and the defense is a problem. I mean, we kind of knew that anyway, but I'm really surprised by how ineffective this offense has been given all the pieces that they have. I mean, you put it all together. Somehow they're just dramatically worse than the sum of their parts. Certainly should have been a next step type of season for that offense. Um, and even if even if you didn't have massive expectations for Marshawn Lynch coming off, you know, uh, missing a season, they at least it was again just a different element to the run game, added to the weapons, added to Derek Carr's development and the offensive line. The offense should have been better. I think part of my optimism with the Raiders was just projecting their defense and saying, okay, they've added these yeah. pieces in the secondary. They've got a superstar in Khalil Mack. Just got to get a little bit better on the defensive line. Mario Edwards coming back. Eddie Vanderdose as a rookie. And we saw some of that early in the season. Um, so I don't know. I'm not ready to completely write them off, but uh, last two weeks certainly have been concerning. Now Derek Carr dealing with a back injury. Um, on the back of that, my confession is going to be the Denver Broncos. Same division. Mm. You know, this was one of those. I'm with you there. This is one of those divisions where the more you just break down these teams on paper, we were all somewhat high on the Los Angeles Chargers. Mike Renner had them go into the Super Bowl in 19 and 0 glory, I think. But we all had the Chargers improving. We had the Raiders improving and taking the next step. We the Chiefs were the number two team in the AFC last year, and I just looked at Denver and said, "All right, so they still have players on defense, but it's a new scheme." And I don't know if I trust Trevor Simeon to take the next step at quarterback. And the offensive line's not great. Um, but so far, now they've played three out of four games at home. And those are the games that they've won. But so far, Denver's defense is where I think I screwed up the most. Yeah. Was thinking that losing Wade Phillips and their aggressive man-heavy scheme was going to you know, offset the fact that they still have this three-headed monster in the secondary that can cover. Still have Von Miller that can rush the passer. You've got a guy like Shaq Barrett who's emerged opposite him so they just have enough so much talent on defense even with a bit of a scheme change they're still a very good team and very difficult to beat at home well also guys that are not supposed to be good are playing well Domita Peko is grading well he is he has the highest grade that he's had since 2007 um, the past five seasons wow. of Domita Peko's grading go 43.1 43 50.6 and 48.4. That's what he's coming into the season on the back of. And now he's up at 78.9. He suddenly turned into a legitimate run defending interior force. And when you combine that with Shaq Barrett, with Von Miller, with all the other guys that got there, it, the, the depth guys we thought would be a problem because they kind of thinned out since they had just so many weapons all over that defense are actually all playing really well. It's bizarre. It's, a, it's a definitely a huge part of their success, getting Adam Gotts is playing well in year two. Shelby Harris, who we always mention on the podcast, has this emerging player. Still have Brandon Marshall in the middle, who's a pretty solid linebacker. Uh, and how about safeties? We got Justin Simmons, who made some big plays yesterday, and your boy Will Parks. Will Parks. Out of Arizona, a guy that was one of our uh, early favorites over at PFF College in our college grading. So uh, credit Denver. Also, I want to say this about Trevor Simeon. Uh, week three, not good at Buffalo, but... Overall, pretty good decision-making. Have to credit Mike McCoy and his play calling. I think they're taking advantage of what Simeon does really well. He likes to throw to his left. He's got pretty good zip outside the numbers. They're throwing a lot of the passes that that he can hit. So 
Yeah, so he's been better. They're mitigating all these weaknesses, I would say. They've got C.J. Anderson back, like the real C.J. Anderson, the guy that can actually run the ball before he's busted up and you know knackered. Well, I also um, I like him in the scheme better too. The, the old Kubiak scheme is that outside zone system, and Anderson they run a much more versatile run scheme now. And Anderson can run anything. He could run Kubiak scheme too. I still like him going downhill a lot more. Definitely, that, that's what Denver. I mean, doing. he is way more of a a kind of a power short area runner than he is trying right. to make him sprint to the sideline then find the one cut i mean when he broke a big run yesterday <laughs> i was trying to think of a way of describing him lumbering up the sideline trying to outrun a defense inevitably going to get chased down from behind and they the the commentary came back with the word rumbling and it was it was the perfect word for it you could just see him oh he's a rumbler gets out in the open field and you're like there's no way you're outrunning anybody at this point it's just a case of get what i can before they track me down from behind. But in short areas, he's perfect for that. It's just that you know he's not going to... It's not a home run threat, you know? He's not taking it the distance unless a lot of things go wrong between him getting the ball and the end zone appearing. But a very efficient running back and very efficient in this versatile run scheme. They said they were going to implement power and gap and zone, and they are doing it uh, and doing a good job with it so far. Menelik Watson watch another sack yesterday. He which did, is, and then he gets hurt. Yes, for a play. Yes. His backup is Donald Stevenson. Yes. Not the guy that we named the award after. This is Donald, not Dwight. And he comes in. One snap. And gives up a sack. Yes. Uh, now, Donald had a few other snaps at tight end. Also had help on the sack. He did. And Vaughn ran through it all. And this was, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Khalil. Uh, yeah. Khalil ran through it all. Sometimes I just get these unbelievable edge rushes confused. This was almost a game changer in the game. It was initially ruled a fumble on this sack, but Simeon's knee was just barely down. It was almost, and this is what I keep coming back to with the Raiders' defense. Khalil Mack has this opportunity. He could take over games at any time. If he could just get some help, consistent help around him, either rushing the passer or consistent guys in coverage, that defense can be that much better because he, at any given time, can have a two-sack, two-hit, four-hurry game, strip sack, play the run well because he's a defensive player of the year candidate. So Watson, watch, definitely improved from six after two games. But we're How still at, sacks now? We're at seven. He's only added one. He kept a clean sheet last week, at least when it comes to sacks. Um, so we're at seven after four games. So Again, pace is 28. Though, yes. This is what we're shooting for. We're shooting for 20. If you can hit the 20-sack mark after the season, which given his schedule, I still think is doable with uh, three quarters of the season left. So Menelik, good job uh, keeping pace. We will throw another tally up on the wall here in our podcast closet in the Cincinnati offices. Before we dive into some more of our screw-ups and misses, I want to tell you about our friends over at Draft. That's Draft.com or Draft in your app store. A great way to play fantasy football. They've got some full-season leagues where it's uh, best ball. They just grab your best players every single week. I have a number of those leagues going. Uh, but they're adding new games every couple minutes. Head-to-head drafts, three-person drafts. New games continue to start. And we are giving you guys a chance to get a free $3 game. You can win real money over at Draft, and you just use the promo code PFF. You'll get a free $3 game, chance to win real money. It is so easy to use. My initial draft, I think, took uh, about a half hour to 45 minutes, and these smaller leagues are even quicker. So it's quick and easy, and I would suggest having multiple leagues going at the same time. That's how easy it is. And you don't even have to go back and check it because, again, they're going to grab your best player so you don't have to worry about trades or waiver wire or injuries. So get over to Draft.com or search Draft in your app store. Use the promo code PFF for your first $3 game today. All right, Sam, where else did you screw up in the preseason? Well, I think we kind of covered the bills already, the the idea that they are – leading the division after three games with only one loss having knocked off two of the better teams in the league is kind of staggering we had them at least i thought they would be one of the worst teams in the league i thought they were given what they had done in terms of trades and rebuilding what looked to an obvious sort of 2018 look i figured them for one of the worst records i think that's kind of amazing but the other one that really stands out is the giants are 0 and 4 and their defense is bad so, again, I'm going to give a shout-out to Eric Eager and his breakdown that the Giants were such overachievers last year, hmm. such an anomaly, that it was almost inevitable 
regression. Sure. So his numbers, PFF, ELO, and the, the numbers that are uh, helping, uh, helping us pick games and pick games against the spread, which is all part of PFF Elite, those numbers pegged the Giants and actually pegged the Bills. And he took a lot of heat. He had a lot of uh, quit your job type of heat. And, he, and the, this system essentially. Like every week. We do. We always do. Our Lions fans still hate us, but give it time. Um, the thing about this system, though, is it combines you know, the way teams play against each other with PFF grades. And it rolls all this information in. And I do think over time it's extremely valuable. And I was even questioning him. Like, come on, dude. Why are the Giants so low and the Bills so high? And that's just one example where I think. This thing really nailed it. Yeah, and I'm, I'm fine with the idea that they would regress and they wouldn't be as good a team overall, but it's the individuals that are playing badly that I don't understand. Jason Pierre-Paul is playing like crap. Jason Pierre-Paul can't rush the passer right now. He's not got a good run defense because grade he either. he never came off the field last year. Mike Renner was He's shouting from... He's never come off the field for years. That's it, not it a It wears thing. on you, man. It's too much. You think just coincidentally it's destroyed both him and Olivier Vernon in exactly the same season this, I mean, it's years they coming. They played what over a thousand snaps last year. Yeah, but it doesn't like that doesn't. It, that's not a new thing for Pierre Paul. Okay, it was a new thing for Vernon, but those two guys are both playing badly. Uh, it's. I mean, even Snacks Harrison hasn't been as dominant as he's been in the past. The defense as a whole is dramatically worse than it was a year ago when it really carried this team. If the defense is going to be bad, of course they're going to suck because the offense can't get anything going. Yeah. So even coming into the year, we had some serious concerns. About Eli Manning in particular, I did think that the pieces that they added at wide receiver would elevate him. I thought his, uh, and statistically he's been okay, and he's actually played okay. He hasn't been as bad as maybe the 0-4 record uh, would show, but uh, it does look like the Giants are in a bit of trouble. As far as the Bills, that was my other, that was my other bad one as well. I don't think anybody expected much from the Bills, but no. it is it has been fun to watch. The defense is playing well. They're making, you know. They're making do with what they have, and it is, uh, it's is—it's an interesting watch. That's why they're leading the AFC East, Sam. They're, yeah. If the playoffs ended today, Bills are, Bills are in. AFC and then champs. My only AFC other East thing champs. is I'm just done with underdog teams. I thought the Browns would be better than they've been. It turns out they just still they are terrible. Um, same deal with Chicago. I thought the Bears would actually be a significantly improved team this year. It turns out they're still bad, even though they're now going to Mitch Trubisky to solve all their woes. Um, I, I mean, we were talking about this before. I feel a little bit sorry for Mike Lennon. Again, with the caveat that the man's taken home like $18 million this season for being terrible. Um, so there's only so much you can feel bad for the we guy. We should all be that unlucky. Yeah. Uh, but, and he hasn't played well. So I don't want to say that Mike Lennon has been great and everything else has been the problem. But you thought he was going to get a longer shot than he has? No, I don't even think he's... It's more the way things have developed, I think he's unfortunate, right? So... I, I mean, he may, I may have thought that he would get slightly longer purely because John Fox seemed pretty stubborn about this stuff. To be honest, week one of the preseason, I said that the way Trubisky played and the way Glennon played, this should have become a live competition right then. You and me both, so man. So if, yeah. if they'd gone with Trubisky starting week one, I wouldn't have had a problem with it. Right. But they ended up, they, they went with Mike Glennon. They said, this is our starting quarterback. He's going to be the guy, right? And we've paid him. So you, you almost expect that the way Fox was, uh, was acting – this was going to be Glennon's year, and then they get rid of him and Trubisky comes in next season. But because of the way they've started, everything has been so bad that they're now getting rid of, they're turfing Glennon out and Trubisky's coming in. But, and, and as I say, I don't think Glennon has been good, so I don't want, you know, I don't want to say that Glennon's been playing fantastic and everything else has been the issue, but he has really not been helped by everything around him. One, we're probably looking at the worst receiving core in the NFL, who coming into this week had dropped the most passes in the NFL. So you've got a bad receiving core that isn't getting open, and when they are getting open and Glenn is getting them the ball, they're dropping it. So they're making him look dramatically worse than he's playing. Two, you had an offensive line that we thought was going to be among the league's best offensive lines heading into this year with the best interior right. group anywhere. They all get injured, and... So Kyle Long has missed time. Josh Sitton misses time. Cody Whitehair has to play all three positions, sometimes in a game, and was playing terribly because of that. So the, the offensive line was supposed to be a strength. It suddenly turns into a huge weakness protecting Mike Glennon. So everything that was supposed to be working in his favor was unraveled around him. Now Trubisky going to come in the exact week the offensive line is suddenly healthy again. So it's going to look dramatically better as soon as the rookie comes in 
which kind of shafts Glennon a little bit. Oh, oh look, the rookie comes in and suddenly it's not a problem anymore. It's like, yeah, well, because all the guys got healthy that week. Poor Mike Glennon. Um, now, the receiving should still be terrible, but, it, you know, I just think Glennon has been a little unfortunate the way that's developed. Look, I think they might have a shot with Trubisky at the helm, almost like what we're talking about Buffalo doing on defense without great personnel, scheming things. Uh, Dowell Loggins, the offensive coordinator for Buffalo, uh, for Chicago, I think does a really nice job. I thought he did a nice job last year getting the most out of Brian Hoyer, Jay Cutler, Matt Barkley. I think he's going to get something out of Trubisky. Zach keeps telling me that, hey, Trubisky's not the type of guy that needed to sit. I agree. Right? And I think we've all yeah. come to that conclusion, conclusion right? There's always this sit versus play debate. Let him go out there and play. Yeah. And part of that's just like, do you have the mentality to be able to bounce back and handle adversity and all that stuff? Plus the fact that he just hasn't played a lot of football. So just go play. I don't even it's know. Time. I don't even know what exactly it is that I'm arguing because I think that it's probably the right move for them to make. And at long term, it's definitely the right move to make. And I agree. I, th- I think Trubisky is not a guy that needs to sit for whatever reason. He's a guy that just gets it immediately. Right. The way Russell Wilson got it immediately. So put him out there because yep. anything else is just wasting time. I just think that Glennon's been unlucky. You know, the way things have, it, the way things have gone have made him look more of the problem than he was. So, I, yeah, I mean, That's there's only fair. so much you can feel sorry for the guy given that, like I say, he's taken home $18 million to just now sit in his ass for the next three months. But well, the checks will still, still get clashed, uh, cashed for the rest of the season. Poor Mike Glennon. Uh, Poor Mike. Quick break, quick word to tell you about our friends over at Prediction Machine. This episode is brought to you by Prediction Machine. Dot com. Prediction Machine is a new generation in sports analytics where they play the games 50,000 times before they're actually played. Make better picks with proven data-driven analysis. Subscribe at PredictionMachine.com today and earn a $5 credit that can be used towards the purchase of any package. All right. I don't think there's any other confession other than I think we all thought the charges would be better. I think I'm with you on the Browns and the Bears. I just I just expected... Uh, better from those teams and then the lions like we always talk about the lions they continue to find a way to win and i do like giving credit to their guys on defense that have stepped up this year from the quandre Diggs and the guys that we talked about a couple weeks ago uh quandre Diggs really surprising the fact that he's playing yeah. well uh glover quinn playing really well at safety darius slay's always kind of been a pretty solid outside cornerback he's maintained that anthony zettel one of the better Defensive lineman in the league through four weeks, four sacks, one hit, and fifteen hurries. So you're uh, you're Eric Eager and the analytics team. The the system's going to hate them again this week because they only just struggled past the Minnesota Vikings with Case Keenum at quarterback and Dalvin Cook breaking his knee and a fumble and the turnovers and ah, uh, I mean it's they won and they've gone to three and one. They're now atop the division, but it's not going to do them any favors in terms of the analytics system. Okay, and before you guys tell eric to quit his job again uh do you understand that this isn't so much a power ranking of here's your resume here's what you guys have done and here's where you get no it's what a power ranking should be it's right it's it's what do we really think you are yeah and over 16 games we think this is all gonna gonna even up right so i think what when when you see power rankings on other sites this week you'll probably see the patriots and the you'll, you'll see like the lions ahead of the patriots and the Bills ahead of the Patriots. When deep down, do you really think ultimately those teams are better? Probably not. And and I mean, I don't think so. But we'll see what happens. Uh, so it's 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 a combination of what we know has already happened in previous seasons, what's happened so far this year, and what we think is going to happen. I'm just saying, Lions fans are going to hate us again when they see those rankings. Lions fans always hate us. Uh, by the way, they're winning despite Matthew Stafford the last this week. Weeks. This week. Now, last week they lost to Atlanta, but Matthew Stafford has taken a step back after looking good in his first two weeks. All right, we've got some PFF Elite stats for you. We're doing this every week, pulling stats out of PFF Elite. That's our number one package over at PFF. Go check it out at profootballfocus.com if you're interested. Also, just leave a five-star review because we're giving away one PFF Elite package every single week. So leave us, leave us a five-star review. Leave your name or an email address or some way that we can get in touch with you, a Twitter handle, and we will give away one free PFF Elite every week. Sam, give me your first PFF Elite stat of the week. All right. Everybody knows that pressure 
affects quarterbacks typically causes a 30 odd point drop in passer rating from somewhere in the 90s on average to somewhere in the 60s on average tom brady under pressure this season has a passer rating of 138.5 which not only is the highest mark in the league by some distance there are only two quarterbacks with a passer rating over 100 under pressure so far but it's also higher than any quarterback's passer rating on when they're kept clean this season. That's crazy. So Tom Brady under pressure this year has a higher passer rating than any other quarterback when they're kept clean in the pocket this year. That's that, silly. That is an amazing stat. And he's a man. He's 40. So he is 40. That's even Maybe crazy. it's all the water he drank. I don't know. Have you read his book? No. TB12? I have read the snippets of his take on various different types of water, which apparently the properties of which include immunity to sun uh, burn i might have to dive into this thing water well i i do i the do book believe or water? i do believe in water as just a great natural supplement hydration is your friend i'm i'm sure. all i'm all about that i've it's, learned that through the years it's sunscreen properties are a little more questionable i would have thought i might need to do more research yeah but look tom brady playing some really well play, playing some really good football at he age is. 40 and he drinks a lot of water i mean drinks, the, the saying, data points are there what if my analysis could get quicker and better by drinking more water? Well, you've got to offset that with the number of times you're going to have to get up and go to the bathroom. Okay, so we need to do some experimenting and figure out just how much water is right. Okay, my first stat, uh, Sammy Watkins, they pick him up, Los Angeles Rams, and in a trade, we've uh, in well actually this week, I told you we talked about Jared Goff and what has made him good. Well, when Jared Goff targets Sammy Watkins so far this season, Perfect passer rating of 158.3. All part of PFF Elite. You're the old wide receiver rating. So good job, Sammy Watkins. Hasn't been a ton of targets, but perfect so far. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, we talked before about how Deshaun Kaiser doesn't exactly help out his pass protection. And, you know, Joe Thomas being a medical marvel, still being the standard of left tackle play, despite uh, just a who's who of quarterbacks, none of whom seem to help him out. You think he's on the TB12 method? Maybe. Maybe he drinks a lot of water. He must. Um, Deshaun Kaiser this season has been hit as he's thrown uh, 10 times, which is two and a half times more than anybody else in the league. Wow. Yeah, so there's definitely an element to the quarterback being a part of that. Offensive line's a part of that. But usually a lot of those, a lot of those numbers do stem from holding the ball a little bit too long. All right, so coming into the season, the Dallas Cowboys, one of their big questions, and they don't rush the passer a ton. They, they'll send three, uh, three men quite a bit four-man rushes but we wanted to see them rush the passer a little bit more and they draft taco charlton in the first round to be that guy when little do they know lawrence taylor was just sitting on their roster just lingering waiting for his chance demarcus lawrence taylor it's not really lawrence taylor demarcus lawrence has you should use that you need to tweet that right now i did it's gonna tweet get that last you did tweet that giants fans were so mad <laughs> they were so mad at me how dare you <laughs> even use a, especially a cowboy comparing him to Lawrence Taylor I don't really think he's Lawrence Taylor but the guy is off to an amazing start through four games DeMarcus Lawrence has eight more pressures than all other edge defenders 30 pressures through four games Vaughn Miller number two with 22 that's a dominant start for DeMarcus Lawrence maybe even a little defensive player of the year consideration if we're being honest through a quarter of the year a quarter sure of the year uh, that's a game changer for the Dallas defense I know it's not showing up in record but it's something that Dallas really needed. Or, in fact, in points. Or in points. But, look, <laughs> maybe it's not a game changer, but it's <laughs> other things have regressed uh, is what we'll say. Other things have, have regressed. It's useful. It's, it, doesn't it's, turn, it doesn't look like it's actually making any difference, but it's a good thing to have. Generally, it's good for the team. Eight sacks, four QB hits, and 18 hurries for DeMarcus Lawrence. So everyone knows what LeGarrette Blunt is. Um, you know, the Blunt object. He is the, the smash mouth component of any running game. And so far, the numbers are absolutely backing that up. LeGarrette Blunt this year is averaging five yards per attempt after contact. Um, he is averaging 5.9 yards per attempt overall, and five of them have come after contact. He has broken 16 tackles on just 42 carries. 209 of his 249 rushing yards are after first contact. So good luck trying to tackle LeGarrette Blunt. I yeah. don't want to try it. That is backing it up. Wow. Look, Garrett Blunt. So is that offensive line, or is that just he's slow to get to the hole and everybody's making first contact? I mean, the offensive line wasn't great the first couple of weeks. I, I mean, he's not exactly flying through 
you know, open holes and getting significant yardage before he's touched, but you're not bringing him down in, a, in any kind of easy manner. He's always been quietly productive. Yeah. All right, my last stat is your weekly Jalen Ramsey stat. It's like the Jalen Ramsey stat of the week. Don't smile at me, Taylor. He thinks we're just turning this into a PFF Jalen Ramsey podcast. But it's a good stat that you can find in PFF Elite. We have a stat called yards per cover snap. It's essentially how many yards did you give up divided by how many snaps you were in coverage. And usually the league leader is it's certainly under one. The league leader is at like 0.5 or 0.6 in a given year. 0.8 is really good. Anything over one, around one is average. And once you get into like the 1.34, 1.5 range, that's pretty bad. Ramsey, 0.3, 0.30 yards per cover snap. That's number one among all cornerbacks with at least 140 snaps in coverage so far. So the year two cornerback for the Jaguars certainly – living up to that draft type as a top-end first-round pick and becoming one of the best corners in the league. Jacksonville's Richard Sherman, Sam. Jacksonville's Richard Sherman. Wow, that's Well, they're building that Seattle team. That's, out there. that's their guy, right? They are, yeah. And look, I, I think Jar, Jalen Ramsey is absolutely playing out of his skin. Um, last season, for some sort of context, uh, Terrence Newman led the league in that statistic at 0.57 yards per coverage snap. There were only, what, 20 guys uh, that were under one. So to be a third, less than a third of a yard per coverage snap is pretty phenomenal. Um, he is genuinely, I mean, he's sort of standing on the precipice of greatness. We could be looking at the next great cover corner in Jalen Ramsey. If you combine, and I haven't run the numbers this year plus last year, but last year in his last five games, he had nine pass breakups as well. So there was a point last season where he started to show this, yeah. where he took that massive step forward. He's carried it in to this year uh, so far through two years. Last year could end up being a really good cornerback class um, because I think we're seeing there's a few guys who, who ended last season and began this season extremely strongly. Um, Ramsey, obviously one of them. James Bradbury in Carolina was playing really good stuff by the end of last year, showed some extremely uh, impressive traits and ability to recognize plays and make plays. Artie Burns, who we didn't like as a pick in the first round, but is always a talented player, right. began last season really badly. By the end of the year, he was playing pretty well, and he's begun this year really well. Um, so yeah, last year's cornerback group could end up proving an extremely good one. Ken Crawley? Another second-year guy, and Anthony Brown with Dallas. Your boy Jalen Mills. Jalen Mills. Well, okay, maybe, maybe I, that's the, uh, maybe that's the one that doesn't quite. I'm a little disappointed in Vernon Hargraves, and where he's been. I thought he was yeah. capable of. I thought he was capable of winning in multiple schemes. I feel like he's just uh, size was always an issue with Hargraves on the field against bigger receivers. We still see that at the NFL level. So um, I still have hope that he'll bounce back, but. Anthony Brown, another one that doesn't get nearly enough ink. He's actually been him. playing. You didn't hear me. He's actually been playing really well he for has. both last year and this year. He's an interesting player. Yeah, and I think this year's cornerback class off to a good start. Marshawn Lattimore and Tredavious White, they've combined for 10. I'm sorry, Tredavious White has six pass breakups. Uh, Adoree Jackson has four. That's 10 between the two of them. The rest of the rookie class has 12. But Tredavious White and Marshawn Lattimore, the best two rookie corners so far. This Adoree year. Jackson also has the same number of pass breakups as Des Bryant. Explain your pass breakup Des Bryant's number. Des Bryant. People didn't even get it on Twitter the whole time. They were like, dude, that's not a pass breakup. Well, yeah, some people, you know, you, some people, you can, you can lead the horse to water, but you can't make him drink. You can't. So Des Bryant has, in the last two weeks only, I'm not even, I haven't seen all four of his games in their entirety. I'm only working on the last couple of weeks that I've seen has broken up three interceptions that Dak Prescott threw directly to defenders. So if you add those three together, you add in the extra pass that actually caused an interception because Des Bryant dropped it, uh, otherwise known as deflected it into the arms of a defender. Right. That, those are four pass breakups. So Do we need a Des Bryant pass breakup tracker? I'm thinking we might need it at this point. If that continues as Taylor, is. Add it to the wall. Des Bryant has four pass breakups on the season, which heading into that week was like, tied for sixth among all defensive backs we'll keep and he's a wide him. receiver and i'm not even saying that's like the entirety of them who knows what happened in week one and week two maybe there were more we'll keep tallying them up we'll have to go back and make sure we watch every single target see if he saved dak of any other interceptions 
Anything else from week four? It's been a pretty crazy NFL season. I think every year you get a little bit of a little bit of craziness, right? And uh, it's been a, yeah. it's a pretty good quarter point. How many pass breakups do I need to start the Des Bryant for Defensive Player of the Year campaign? Probably has to close in on seven or eight. Seven or eight? Yeah. Okay. So it's on Dak. Dak's got to throw a few more passes Couple to cornerbacks and, uh, and let Des make plays. All right, guys, that'll do it for us today. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button if you guys are just checking in because the content does not stop on the PFF podcast the rest of the week. I'll be joined by Zach Robinson for an in-depth breakdown of quarterbacks from around the league. Sam and I will be back on Wednesday for, I think, our favorite new episode, the Mailbag Edition. Might even have some really great in-depth offensive line talk from one of our newest PFF analysts and former NFL player. Uh, We'll leave that teaser right there, so check in on Wednesday for that. And then Thursday, of course, Sam and I will be joined by the great Mike Renner to preview all of next week's action. So hit the subscribe button, stick with us all week. Don't forget to leave that five-star review as well for your chance to win a free PFF Elite subscription. And if you're looking for PFF Edge, there's no better place to get it than profootballfocus.com forward slash PFF dash offers. That's our best offer for PFF Edge where you can find our player grades, fantasy analysis, and guys, we just dropped signature stats for college players a 70 page pdf that will be updated weekly on draft eligible college players it's all a part of pff edge every single week what you got sam we are also going to be dropping something new this week for elite subscribers those guys are going to get game by game player grades Oh, that's official? That everybody's wanting. Yeah, it's breaking this week. I think Wednesday those are dropping. So. I told you, it's like the, our first class yeah, PFF Elite game. subscribers. They've been begging for game-by-game grades. Right now, our player grades as part of Edge have season grades. Season grades go back to 2006, but game grades. That is a game changer for the Elite members. So if you guys have Edge and you're trying to upgrade to Elite, uh, you do get a discount. You do get your money back as, essentially as far as what you paid for Edge, but I think it might be worth the upgrade if you're going to get those game by game grades everybody wants the upgrade everybody wants to have the gold shiny thing not the silver shiny thing everybody wants the gold pff elite check it out hit that subscribe button thanks again guys for listening and we will talk to you guys next time